All right, welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, co-conspirator, partner in crime, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. We're very excited to have in studio right now uh, Daryl Chambers, who uh, has the rare honor to be uh, what I consider a double OG. Now, we're the, <laughs> we're the Original Gangsters podcast, and we're all about celebrating the OGs. Well, Daryl is an OG in two separate arenas. He's an OG when it comes to the world of professional boxing and the Kronk Gym, which uh, is iconic when, when you're talking about uh, the world of, of pro boxing, especially in the city of Detroit. Uh, boxing in the city of Detroit uh, are synonymous with, with the Kronk Gym brand, Manny Stewart, Tommy Earns. Daryl was there from the very start and then eventually uh, transitioned into the street uh, <laughs> and became uh, quite the, uh, the gentleman a uh, businessman, drug kingpin, uh, <laughs> who picked up a lot of the pieces from the crazy 1980s, uh, the Wild West, if you will, um, with a lot of high-profile, violent drug groups that were killing each other. Um, Daryl kind of, you know, laid back in the cut, if you will. And when all those guys either died or went to prison, Daryl kind of picked up the pieces and, and kind of put everything back together, uh, but in a much more professional manner. And then this is what we'll get into. I'm going to turn it over to Daryl in a second. He really became a, uh, a, a prisoner of war, if you will, in the war on drugs, because although Daryl uh, will tell you that he was a, a wholesale cocaine trafficker, um, he was not someone that deserved to do life in prison. And the government had an agenda. Uh, my research uh, has has showed me, and I've had this confirmed on, on multiple fronts, that uh, the government wanted to go after the Kronk Jim. They wanted to go after Manny Stewart. They wanted to go after Tommy Hearns, not for drug dealing, but for helping certain high-profile uh, gangland figures in Detroit, uh, not Daryl, guys like Maserati Rick Carter and Demetrius Holloway that were spending a lot of time uh, around the Kronk Gym and around the Kronk Gym fighters, uh, they were convinced that uh, uh, Manny and, and Tommy and some of those guys were were helping uh, launder drug money. And they saw uh, Daryl and, and and some people that Daryl was with as a way to bring those guys down. And when Daryl didn't really have anything to, to give them uh, in terms of any cooperation, they, they decided to jam Daryl and sent him to prison for the rest of his life. Fortunately, he was able to get out of it for 26 years, and now he's here to tell tell us his story. Thank you for joining us, Daryl Chambers. Okay. I appreciate <laughs> that. I didn't know if I was on cue there. Yeah. But, yeah, thanks a lot. And I understand what you're saying. It's like, wow, the whole story is a blessing just to be here, you know? But, but, you, but you did a quarter century uh, in prison— <laughs> On a nonviolent drug offense. Yeah, first offender. First offender. Um, again, not saying that uh, what you did uh, didn't deserve some form of punishment, but uh, to think that uh, if there hadn't been certain intervening factors, you could have died in prison. Um, it's really, uh, it, it, it's perplexing. And again, r to me, reemphasizes the fact that uh, every in terms of the war on drugs, which has been, I mean, I guess officially has been going on since the Nixon administration. Uh, yeah, that, that's when they amped it up. Unofficially right. for even longer. I mean, everybody has lost. <laughs> yeah. There's no winners. Drugs won. The war yeah. is over. Drugs won. Um, and and we've talked about, we were just talking about someone earlier today, and we won't mention names, but but people were involved in armed robbery, like real violent crimes, and, and received less time, time in I, prison than, yeah. than what you did. Yeah. And, and I that seems... Like, that doesn't seem, uh, like, it seems like the criminal justice system is not working the way it and should then, be And then in some happens. cases, you have people, and I'll, the most famous instance is Al Capone, who's put, a, put in prison on a nonviolent offense, but, you know, it's well known in law enforcement circles, in the public, that they are a violent criminal and they right. have a, uh, a laundry list of bodies. Daryl is the polar opposite of that. Daryl's Daryl or people that Daryl was uh, connected with on the street were not convicted uh, or convicted or connected to really any violence at all. Um, and he was still being treated as if he was a Maserati Rick Carter or he was a Demetrius Holloway. And, and Daryl will tell us he knew those guys and, and 
uh, had come up around those guys, but uh, they, they, their business uh, methodologies were, were totally different. <laughs> yeah. Daryl, can you, can you expand on that yeah, a little bit? Yeah, I can understand. Like, it was completely different. It's like, like I came up, I come up off the east side of Detroit, you know, so, you know, that's kind of like a, a rough neighborhood and everything, but I started boxing when I was like 11 years old, so, you know, my thing was like going to the gym, come back, and that was like, and that was like, was was great, you know, but it's still, I know the game because I lived in, you know, in the neighborhood, but boom, I just go straight to the gym and stuff. And uh, like you say, I'm not, I'm the first person to say this, I we need the government. Don't get it twisted. We need police <laughs> force and everything. Too much chaos. But it's just like the things that they, they do is like I tell you a quick story. A friend of mine, when I first went to jail, so I'm in jail like about five, six years. A friend of mine, he's always sending me money. I said, you know, I got some money. I'm good. I got a few dollars left. No, nah, man, you know, I'll stop by your house and look out for your daughter and everything. I said, okay, cool, my kids and stuff. So then he was sending me money, sending me money. Then he turns around and get um, he got robbed. And uh, had a shootout in his house. They went to rob him. They shoot out his house, and he killed the dude. But it was justifiable homicide. But he still went to jail for like I think seven years. He got out of jail, turned around, got back, got my information again, and started sending me money again. And on the phone one time, I talked to him. He said, "Hey man, you know what's so crazy, man?" I said, "What?" You said, "He said I killed two people, man." He said, "I killed two people. Got convicted of murder. Went did did I think seven or twelve years in the state." He said, you know what's crazy? I said, what is that? He said, you still, I'm still out here sending you money today, and you ain't out of jail, and you ain't killed nobody. Is that crazy? I said, yeah, that's something else. And they weren't man. sending you to club fed. You were in Leavenworth. Yeah. You, you know, were in... Uh, I was. I started in Terre Haute, and was so crazy Haute, about it. I mean, you were in some pretty yeah, bad, I, bad Yeah, prisons. it was some of the worst one. Like, at that time, Terre Haute and uh, Marion was uh, one of the two worst places. Man, Marion was a lockdown. You know what I'm saying? Then Terry Huff was a five, I think they call it a level five. But I went in there with six points. That's like unheard. I had count points when I went to jail. So what they had to do, I had four points. What they had to do, they had to give me two more points by me having life sentence to put me into uh, the high, what you call it, penitentiary, high level of the penitentiary. So, he, so I was a first offender, nonviolent crime. So I go in with four points, and they put, give me two more extra points just to put me there. So I stayed there for a while. And uh, um, then I left there. Then they sent me to Maryland. Uh, now they sent me to Colorado. Now, Florence, Colorado, this time, was the next highest. Uh, this is like, they're so in Florence, Colorado, you got the super max, which is underground. Right, like underground. And then you have the regular the, max. Yeah, is, the regular max, but it's the high security regular yeah. max. So they sent me there, and I stayed there, I think, about eight, nine years. But I stayed, and I stayed shot free, no shots, period. Then I ended up going Then They ended up sending me to Maryland. And Maryland had just came off of a... Uh, being like a, a lockdown prison. And they 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 put it as a FCI. But no, they put it as a penitentiary, but they said, but they left, but they made it an FCI level. So you had the same thing, but you just weren't locking your cell all the time. So they the COs were like on you, like, oh man, everywhere you move, they was worse than uh Terry Hut for really. I, I can't imagine, and I've talked to Daryl on a number of occasions. I talked to him when he was locked up. I wrote some stuff that uh dare I say, helped get him out um, to, to bring attention to his case. And I, I just can't imagine staring at life in prison under the circumstances that you were under and not losing all faith in humanity and life. <laughs> and And for you to be able to come out the other side of it and have so have so much positive energy, uh, and and being able to write the second chapter, it's uh, it's inspiring for for someone that that has studied you and studied your case. And um, I'm excited to, to share with everyone what kind of the the ins and outs of Daryl Chambers. But it's really a tribute to the type of man you are that you're sitting here and and yeah. still smiling about it. Yeah, thank you for that though. And it's like for real. When I first went to jail, I was kind of like kind of sour about it. Oh man, how did this happen? All this and then, but I. Ran across a lot of older cats was I did a lot of time, and they used to say, "Man, whatever you do, you better do the time. Don't let the time do you, cause you, man, you you stuck." I said, "Stuck." I was saying, "What the time?" I said, "Man, look at you here on the CCE, nonviolent crime, and you're the first offender." He said, "Man, you don't even supposed to be here." I said, "Wait, well, I'm telling you, you stuck." And I was like, "What do you mean stuck?" So we go to the law library all the time. Every time I'm like always something. So then um, when I start filing my as I'm in jail, I'm filing my case. You know, now I'm I'm helping the lawyers help me, you know what I'm saying? So 
Okay, I'm paying them money. And then they do a motion. I write stuff in the motion. And, I, and everything is like getting denied. And I'm like, wow, how's this? You know, I keep on going around. Keep on. So now after 15 years, and this one, my bit started to change a little bit. But after 15 years, now I'm getting mad. Like, man, what is I ain't did nothing of this, you know? And then I'm thinking about what the government offered me. The government offered me a case. It was like on my case that, you know, they had to do a, like a continued criminal enterprise. Actually, you can't get nothing but 30 years if you're a first offender. The top is 30 years, but they I, I was on probation. I had a probation. And I, uh, during the course of, between 1980, they say 1988 to 1994, whatever it was, they had Stanley Lone Street to turn around and say that I was sending him out of town, which I wasn't sending him out of town. I did later, but I wasn't sending him That's out of town. That's one of your co-defendants. Yeah, my co-defendant. Yeah, who was another cronk gym boxer. Oh, yeah, my friend. I'm talking yeah. to pick him up and take him to his gym, yeah. you know. But uh, they had him turn around and say that. And I, you know, like this, and I'm not mad at him. And people say, oh, you ain't mad? I'm not mad at him because life is what it is. And then if you do something, things happen. So, you know, you you know, you know what I'm saying? But, like, with him, I wouldn't have, you know, folded because I know what I was into. But he did, and then, like, the government had him. And it's like, and by him saying that I was sending him out of town, that put me in the Category 1. So in the Category 1, it's natural life across the board. And then it's natural right on my drug amount. And then that was like hocus pocus, you know what I'm saying? Because when they raided, they raided like five different houses and everything. And I, my mother's house, my brother's house, my girlfriend's house, her uh, brother. And then they, they did a what you call a rubber stamp. Everywhere the government said I was at, they just gave a warrant for us. So they went in, and then out of the whole thing, they I think they found, the, I want to say, maybe a half a kilo of powder maybe two ounces, two pounds of weed, and maybe, I think, maybe a quarter or something like that, a crack, you know what I'm saying? And they gave me, and, and in my case, they they gave me uh, they gave me the, the count of a ton and a quarter of powder cocaine. Wow, where did it come from, you know what I'm saying? And it was ghost drugs, you know what I'm saying? And it's all what the government just put together. And it was, in like, in the beginning of my case, it was, they had said, uh, I mean, when they asked me a plea, this what they say. They get bring me to the thing and plea. I said, all right, because I'm thinking to myself, well, I'll take a plea, man, because I have, you know, I was doing something wrong. You know what I'm saying? So I said, I'll take a plea. But then when they brought me the plea, it was so far-fetched. I was like, man, come on with this. And the plea was, uh, if they, they give me a 60-month cap, that means you can't do over uh, five years. And then they say, if Tommy or Emmanuel Stewart convicted, and I said, convicted? So I'm wondering where they put that play in there. I'm looking at it and said, yeah, if Tommy, if you tell on Emmanuel Stewart for, uh, what do you say, Emmanuel Stewart for money laundering, and you tell on Tommy Hearn for financial and drug dealers, we'll give you a 60-month a sixty month cap. And if any one of them get convicted, then you won't do them but like two and a half, 30, if 32 months or something like that. I'm like, I'm looking at I'm like, where they get this whole story from right here. So I'm like, man, what is y'all talking about? He said, well, if, you, if any one of them get convicted, that this would happen, and then we'll put you in the, they had a thing out, uh, protective custody, and they say, we'll move your whole family, and we'll give you a check. And I'm looking, I'm like, man, what this dude talking about? So now I'm kind of mad, though, because where this part come from? And you talking about giving me life? So the prosecutor, I'm like, I'm burning them. So he tell me that. I said, I said okay, this is what I'll do, man. You right. I said, now, this is the stuff that Emmanuel was doing? This is stuff? They said, yeah, 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 this is all stuff you're doing. I said, yeah, okay, then, check this out. This is what y'all need to do. I'm going to work with you on this. You go and arrest him, man, Stewart and Tommy Hearn. And man, the prosecutor said, now nah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we do. I say, because when you arrest, go arrest them. I said, them guys doing all the stuff y'all say they doing, they need to be in jail, not me, because I never did nothing. <laughs> man, he got so mad, he jumped up and went to cussing. You know what I'm talking about? This was a, I forget his name, Mark. Uh, I can't think of it. He, but he took the case. He was from Flint. But he jumped up with Kesson, and he jumped running towards me. Now, this one, I really would have been in trouble. You know, my nature, you know, like. To defend I'm, yourself. You know, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I, I chose to fight. I'm, but I'm not, I'm not violent, but I can be. You know what I'm saying? So uh, when he, he was 20, up, just to let people know, he wasn't just any ordinary <laughs> pro boxer. He was 22 and 2. You know, yeah, I mean, he was a, a, a very, uh, you know, on the rise star. And if things, you know, had gone one way instead of the other, we could be talking about Daryl Chambers the same way we talk about Tommy Earns. Yeah, that too. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, what was so crazy about it, he jumped up and then the, uh, my lawyer stopped. My lawyer, it's a judge hit the thing, so they got mad. But it was just, and then that was like eating me up because it just like, 
all you had to how could that work? And then think about it. The guy telling me about the time he 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 went to jail, he killed two people. And I'm talking about nah, I'm not saying I don't know. I just in my mind, I you know, I believe to kill somebody, I mean, I'm not no judge nowhere. I'm defending myself, I can see that. But just to take a life or whatever, or you know, I can understand. But that's like if it's somebody brother, somebody cousin, somebody uncle, somebody, you know, kids and stuff like that. So I was like, man. But the government is like, it really all depends how they want to play the game. Look at the uh, the Wall Street crooks who caused the a global recession. Only one of them was convicted, and that that caused way more. I would argue caused way more havoc and ruined way more people's lives than uh, narcotics. I'm not saying that narcotics. It's a good idea to use the, use narcotics <laughs> or whatever. I'm not. I'm not trying to be naive about that, but. Yeah, there seems to be certain types of crimes seem to bother Uncle Sam more than others. And let's put it in context to the time that this was all going on. So, you know, as I said at the beginning of the recording, this was at the end of the 1980s. And Maserati Rick and Demetrius Holloway were on the front covers of the newspapers for like five straight years. Yeah. Um, if you watch some of the Tommy Hearns fights on YouTube that were either on CBS or HBO or Showtime or on pay-per-view, you can peep Maserati Rick in the entourage at a number of those oh, yeah. fights walking with uh, uh, walking with Tommy to the ring. Yeah. So, so who, you, just for the audience the unfamiliar with Detroit gangland, give some context on who Maserati Rick and So, so Daryl came from the east side of Detroit, and uh, I'm going to throw it back to Daryl one more uh, soon. One more time, one of many times we're gonna throw it back to him uh, to talk about coming up on the east side and and going to Kronk and and building Kronk into what it became. But in addition to east, the east side of Detroit being this you know fertile breeding ground for great uh, athletes and boxers um, like Tommy Hearns and Daryl Chambers, it, it's also has proven over the years to be a breeding ground for big time criminals and and dope bosses. Um, Maserati Rick. And uh, Maserati Rick Carter and Demetrius Holloway were the um, kind of like the 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 Cadillac or the uh, Lexus or the Tesla, if you will, of the of the dope game in Detroit at that time. Um, they 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 cut very high profile figures. They were very flashy, and they were spending a lot of time at Kronk. And Maserati Rick is killed. And they both died very flamboyant deaths in the mm -hmm, same way that public. they lived. Uh, Maserati Rick is murdered uh, in his hospital bed uh, in the fall of 1988. Demetrius Holloway is has murdered. a very showy funeral. Yeah, it has a funeral where he's buried in a thirty thousand uh, dollar Mercedes with uh, Benz <laughs> convertible um, that's m made into a casket. Right. Um, and Demetrius Holloway gets killed in broad daylight at a men's clothier right in downtown Detroit in 1990. This is all the same time that the government's starting to put their case together against Daryl or starts building it in the early 90s. Daryl, by this point, has uh, retired from boxing and is just kind of in the game. Uh, and again, Daryl wasn't, from my research, Daryl wasn't really the target here. The target was the two biggest names at Kronk, which were Manny and Tommy. And it, we haven't even started to go into the way the case was built against Daryl was incredibly dirty. <laughs> uh, they used, the DEA used a, someone that, the, that they, they will refer to as a quote unquote professional informant. His name was Andrew Chambers, no relation to Daryl, no relation uh, to the Chambers brothers, uh, who are right. also a they were a, East Side too, an right? East Side big name uh, yeah. <laughs> dope clique that had nothing to do with any of this. Chambers um, and uh, Andrew Chambers, Andrew Chambers was brought to Detroit by the DEA. He was a guy from St. Louis. He was brought to Detroit and sent at the Kronk gym, and the DEA said, "Go into Kronk and make a case for us." Yeah, and in order. Uh, for us to get Tommy and Manny, we're going to go through the other guys that are moving weight through the uh, through the gym, and they ended up with three different Kronk boxers. It wasn't just Daryl. It was Daryl, 
a guy named William Longstreet, who went by the nickname Standing the Steamer, who, who Daryl mentioned before, who eventually turned witness against him. And then the most high profile of the group was Donald the Lone Star Cobra Curry, who was a two-time uh, middleweight, uh, welterweight champion, I believe, um, uh, was, was, was a name in the boxing world that stretched around the globe the way that Tommy Hearns is named. And, and if you're unfamiliar with the world of boxing, these names like Stewart, Tommy Hearns, these were royalty. worldwide, worldwide known yeah. figures in this. This wasn't just a Detroit thing. I mean, they were they were started in Detroit. They were located here. And that's but, why. That's why he's a he's a true double OG here, right? Because Daryl started with Manny and Tommy before anybody knew what Cronk Jim was. But by the 1990s, the the Cronk Jim is the is the preeminent name in the world of professional boxing. Right. And Manny Stewart is training his his training has gone beyond just the original Cronk guys like Tommy Hearns he's training all the world champions of the 90s yeah, so these, are, these are big names Lennox Lewis Oliver McCall uh he, he trained Oscar De La Hoya uh I mean these big big names I mean I remember another guy I'm gonna <laughs> I digress a little bit but one of my favorite boxers back in the day was the Prince Prince Nas uh I don't remember who him. was a a, a li- I was a lightweight from Britain he was a Muslim and he came and trained with Manny he he was a big draw uh, for a couple of years in the early 2000s. What about Macho Camacho? Yeah. Hector Camacho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Julio Cesar Chavez. There was a yeah. lot of <laughs> it was a great time. heat that was coming down on Kronk that was the kind of the um, the reverberations or the ripple effects or the hangover from Maserati and Demetrius. And Daryl happened to, to just be in the eye of the storm and took the brunt of it. Why were the feds so hot for Stuart and Hitman? Just because they were public, big public, high profile black, guys? Black people with a lot of money and power <laughs> yeah. does, does, not, <laughs> does not make the government very happy. That's yeah. Uh, I mean, look what Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. And uh, we had, uh, a, I don't want to say a similar situation because the government wasn't going after Isaiah. They were going after the Italians and Isaiah happened to find his way into their crosshairs. Um, with uh, some allegations of point shaving and money laundering, um, so I mean, I think it was the, it was this was the exact same time. Yeah, that happened in 1990. Uh, Holloway got killed in 90. Carter got killed in 88. Daryl's case Daryl's case came in 93, 94, 94. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of notion that if you're a celebrity, you can get away with anything. But but that doesn't apply to people of color who are right. celebrities. You're still you still have a target yeah. on your back. Being a person of color is that supersedes any kind of celebrity status yeah, or wealth. Let's you also have. let people know about Tommy Hearns. In addition to these allegations of possibly uh, being a little too fast and loose in his uh, uh, relationship with Demetrius and Maserati, Tommy was also, I don't want to say, I don't want to say caught because that makes it sound like he was doing something illegal, but Tommy was found out to be hosting mafia run dice games uh, at his mansion. And during one of those dice games, his brother ended up killing his, his brother ended up killing his girlfriend, the brother's girlfriend. And in the litigation and depositions from that case, it came out that Freddie Salem, Freddie the Saint Salem, Alan Health, the Jackalones were that was their dice. That game. was they were running those dice games. The same games they were running at Isaiah's house, they were running at Tommy's house. So Tommy Hearn's brother was Tommy Hearn's brother remember this. killed his girlfriend at one of those parties accidentally, or I'm not. It's a domestic dispute. Holy shit. Yeah. I don't remember. It was, that must have been huge news at the time. We would have been kids, but. Yeah. But my point is, Hearns was already in the, uh, on the radar yeah, right, right. of Got the it. FBI yeah. and the DEA. Yeah. Um, and let's also just state for the record, none of this has ever been proven. I mean, these are right. all allegations. Yeah. Tommy and Manny were never arrested for anything no. or put on trial for anything. There was just the belief of, of a certain factions of the federal government that that was happening and and they were going after that for a while but let's let's go back for a second let's start from the beginning daryl just tell us about 
being having nothing to do with drugs, just being a young up and coming athlete on the east side, gravitating to the cronk, and then talk about when you go. I mean, this was when the seeds were planted. I mean, cronk was nothing in the mid seventies. Right. You were right. the you and Tommy Hearns and a bunch of other guys. You were the originals. You guys were driving around in a van, going around the <laughs> country with right. Manny at the steering wheel, going from a junior. Uh, tournament to junior tournament, Golden Glove tournament to Golden Glove tournament, AU tournament to AU tournament. Yeah, Just right. Before yeah. you became a pro. Right, yeah. And at the time, of my, I remember the time that uh, my father had worked at Chrysler, and he worked nights and stuff. And, uh, and we was going to the Nationals, uh, Nationals, uh, the National AU, the National AU. And then um, I think, uh, let me see, me and Bernard Mays, we we went down and we, uh, it was the junior, National AU, Junior Olympics, though. And uh, I think we were 15, we were 15 years old. And I remember Emmanuel getting a whole bunch of um, chicken donated through the Chronicle. Through uh, You remember the Chronicle? The Michigan dude? Chronicle, yeah, still Michigan around. Chron okay. He he gets somebody to put, a, um, put something in there about, you know, needed donation stuff. So they know the, they donate a whole bunch of chicken. And so he tell my father, he said, well, look, man, you go, and, you go on to Chrysler, you sell these chicken, then they take this money and, you know, help take his son and, but now I'm down and we all go down. And so my father and my mother cooked all the chicken. And my father was, um, you know, he take them to Christ and sell them on the weekends. You know, with they come by and they pick them up. We got that money, and then we went down to a, uh, to what was that at? A oh, Rapid City, South Dakota. And then my mother, my father drove down there, and he had me, Bernard, my father, and Emmanuel, and uh, Leonard Smith. That's another uh, training that at the time when I first started, I started with Leonard Smith. I stayed at that that gym like a year. Then he brought me over to Crump. So we all goes down to uh, go down to Rapid City, South Dakota. Yeah, Rapid City, South Dakota, you know. And the, so that's how it was. And Emmanuel was just like, he's a guy, man. He would get, you know, he really know box because he used to box. He had won the diamond gloves. That was like that was like the nationals, I mean, right? That qualified you for the Olympics. So I think he won the diamond gloves in 61 or 60. And he really was qualified, but him, he got with his wife, and he got married, and he quit boxing and stuff. But when he was training us, he just we you know, it was just like all the dudes out the gym, and he'd get us, and it wasn't like nobody did nobody really had no money. It was just families, you know, and like we all go to the fights, and we all do this. We would go to the like Ohio State Fair. We all stay in the ABC Motel, and you know from um, kids and what he said, well we gonna stay at the hotel, the hotel, yeah, you know that was like big, but and that was like when you got older, then was you know like I don't want to say, yeah, you got to say it. One room, you know, two beds and one TV. That's it. Then you know, all this. Then might be down the street. It might be some women, <laughs> you know, going there. Some you know, social opportunities, right, you know, right down there. So it was like, wow. But we were standing there. That's the things we was doing on, on, on the and, rise. And this up. is like getting insight into, you know, just for for people that are maybe a little younger and that don't understand that pro boxing was at a time in this country. Other than baseball, it was baseball and boxing. Football and basketball were not no. major sports. Those are still like niche really kind until of. the eighties and nineties. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it was boxing sure. and baseball. And and uh, Manny Stewart is is a legend's legend. Forty one heavy or not not heavy. Forty one world champions. Nobody has ever trained more world champions. Throw out than some Manny of the Stewart. names that he, people would recognize. Well. Uh, as I said, it, later in his career, there was Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis, Oscar De La Hoya, um, Tommy Hearns, Milton McCrory. Uh, Jimmy Paul, because he was a champion too. Jimmy Paul, uh, wasn't Jackie Beard. Uh, man, Jimmy Paul, Jackie Beard. Just name a few that won't sit you like too much. Did he train the guy from Frank Pontiac? Tate. Who's the guy Frank from Pontiac? Tate. Bone Crusher? Mar I know Bar Bar uh, Caveman Lee. Yeah, Caveman Lee, Frank Tate. Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull something up. You remember the guy from Pontiac? Wasn't there? Wasn't Bone Crusher from Pontiac? Wasn't that his no, name? No, I know he. I think James no, Tony from Jane Ann Arbor. Tony. Oh, oh, Jane, okay. Jane Timmy, and the, I forget Jackie McCullough. She, I think she was the manager. In Jackie McCullough. Yeah, Jackie Callum. He has Jackie Callum. So uh, he fought, or he fought. He trained uh, Winifred Benitez, uh, Mark Breland, mm. Obacar, Julio Cesar Chavez, Miguel Cotto, Oscar De La Hoya, Tyson Fury. Who's a boxer that's still around right now? The Klitschko brothers, uh, Tommy Hearns, yeah, Prince cool. Nassim Ahmed, Evander Holyfield, Hilmer Kent, uh, Hilmer Kenty, Caveman Lee, Lennox Lewis, Oliver McCall, Mike McCallum, Gerald McClellan, 
Uh, Michael Moore. Yeah. Oh, that's a Detroit heavyweight guy. Champ- he, he wasn't a Detroit guy, but he trained oh, here. But he trained here, right? He, wasn't he won from, the world championship. We, yeah, he you won told me I forgot about that. Yeah. He, uh, he beat Foreman, he right? He beat Foreman. No, no, he lost to Foreman. He lost to Foreman. But he, he beat Holyfield. He beat Holyfield. He beat Holyfield, right. lost to Foreman. Lost to Foreman, yeah. Um, James Tony, Dwayne Thomas, oh, yeah, Ricky Womack. I mean, a lot. Forgot about these names. A lot of guys yeah. in a lot of different weight classes. He's like the Bill Belichick of, yeah, he really is. <laughs> of, of boxing. And uh, the he's, he's been gone now for about 10 years. Yeah, and uh, Tommy's still around. But, you know, I, I can't overstate what a epic figure in the world of professional boxing Manny Stewart was. And, and Daryl was with him, like I said, you know, when the roots were being planted for this empire that that uh manny eventually grew and built yeah. these guys were just like literally 10 to 15 15 year olds yeah. driving around in a van 12 started 12, yeah. 11 years old uh and then uh, almost all of these guys and i want daryl to touch on this became rich and famous uh within 10 years yeah. um <laughs> and and you're this is before daryl starts uh, dabbling um, and and Daryl's just a boxer on the rise with these guys, and you guys, well, you all turned pro in the late seventies, early eighties. Yep, mostly up. Yep. Everybody turned pro around that time, but in the beginning, you know what I'm saying. And uh, that's we yeah we all started from that, and uh, just like just like with uh, Tommy Hearns and Ray Leonard, that was I think it's in the uh, world with World Book again is the record that was the most fight for a welterweight fight ever in the history. Of 19, it was 1981. The first 81? the first Hearns. That was the one uh, most. Uh, Sugar Ray fight was eighty one. Um, I, I'm going to digress a little bit again. Mm-hmm. You know, Tommy Hearns, obviously Motor City Cobra, the Hitman, uh, one of the greatest boxers ever to come out of the uh, city of Detroit, one of the greatest boxers ever, a seven time world champion or six, six or seven time world, world seven time world champion, the Hitman. But, but yeah. his two biggest fights, he was ahead. In both of those fights, mm-hmm. and 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 kind of faded. Uh, I know he was ahead on the card uh, with Sugar Ray in '81 until the latter rounds when when um, Leonard went ahead, and then with Marvelous Marvin, uh, the first two rounds he was winning, and then yeah. he just totally ran out of gas in the third round. He fought Leonard more than once, didn't he? He, yeah. fought, he fought Leonard three, twice, three times. Once twice? was a draw. The last time was a draw. Yeah, that's the fight. That, that was when they were both way past their yeah, prime. He's- one my, of the fights he clearly won the fight, and, he, and either that was the draw. That was the draw. That was okay, the draw. Yeah, he cleared to me. He my my point is, fight. if Hearns wins just one of those fights, yeah. the 81 Leonard fight or the 85 Hagler fight, as much of a legend as he is, as much of a, a goat as he is, he'd be even more of a goat. Yeah. And yeah. my point is, he was so close. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like the, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, the, the Michael Spinks. Oh, uh, Mike Tyson. Tyson fight where it's over with in 20 seconds. Yeah, I remember I mean, that. These were as two fights that, that Tommy Hearns, I don't want to say easily, but could have and should have maybe won those two fights. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, it it just it shows you what I, I've always called you know the thin line theory. And same thing with Isaiah Thomas. I know this is another digression. If Isaiah Thomas wins that uh, that the championship when he broke his ankle in '88, and they won three straight instead of two straight. I think Isaiah Thomas is looked at on the same level as as Jordan and Bird he's, and Magic. He's talking about that first finals against the first Lakers. First finals against the Lakers where they lost they, in seven. And they should have won that anyway. Yeah. Even right. with <laughs> So it's just this kind of thin line theory that I see there's a little bit of an analogy uh, being Detroiters, uh, Tommy Hearns and Isaiah. And they uh, should have beat the Celtics yeah, the yeah, year before. Right. <laughs> so should have been all the place. <laughs> but Daryl, so tell us, I, I talked to you a little bit about this um, in private. Then I, I, I want you to color up a little bit if you can. So. You met Muhammad Ali in the mid seventies. He used to come into Detroit and show up at the yeah, conk yep, and uh, yep, and schmooze yep. with everyone. But then you fought on his Trevor Burbick card. No, I, well I trained with Tommy on his Trevor Burbick Tra- card. Tommy fought yeah, on Tommy the Burbick. Tommy, Tommy fought on the Burbick fought, card. Uh, it was the three world championship fight that was did. So this was in the Bahamas in, the Bahamas in 1981, 1981, and it was Muhammad Ali's Ali Trevor final Burbick. fight. Yep, and uh, Tommy. Uh, fought Michael Singletary. There was another fight, world championship fight. I don't forget which one. So you were in the Bahamas. What, you guys were training for a couple months before the yeah, fight? Yeah, we trained, like, I think we trained, uh, what was it, six, 
fix it all together. Yeah, drama in Bahamas. Month, the drama weeks, in the Bahamas. So about right. four weeks or five weeks or something like we was down there training and stuff. And you're spending that time with 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 Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, yeah, yeah, yeah. the GOAT. Well, yeah, yeah. So you want just talk a little and, bit uh, about being around him. Oh, and, man, one of the greatest persons in the world. He was like that when I first met him in, like, in 75. Everybody in the gym, you know he's the old cat, so everybody in the gym, but he messed with everybody in the gym. Laughs and talk, come on over, let me see you beat the bag. Or let me show you how, to, you know, he used to do all kinds of stuff. All day, he would come over there, and we didn't want to leave. We just wanted to stay at the gym and be oh, yeah. with Muhammad Ali. That's like something great. But every fighter, he would come over there and get... Oh, they make him hit the bag, or he hit the bag, show you how fast he is, all shelf. He just do a lot of stuff. And it was like, wow, this is a great guy, you know, like that. That was like in yeah, 75, yep, 75. Did he did he fight some at Kobo or or, or Joe Lewis? Uh in the it would have been so, Kobo. Yeah, I don't think he fought. In the down. in the seventies. He, he came down there and trained. He had to have fought in the seventies at some point somebody. at Kobo. Yeah, he might have fought it uh maybe early, yeah. He would be too big. Oh, the Olympic, Olympic. No, at Kobo, they were they, they, they were, were having they were staging big fights. They at were, Kobo. yeah, yeah. I don't I don't remember if he fought here, but I know he came. He trained two, three, two, three different times. He came to then he ended up. We ended up going to. He had a a, a training camp in uh, Pennsylvania. In, no, it's one place in Michigan. Oh, he had one in Western yeah. Michigan, which okay. is why he eventually settled. Yeah. Uh, at the end of his life, he was living in so, yeah. in like around uh, Battle Creek. Yes, yeah, Muhammad Ali, was? Benton Harbor. Yeah, yeah he lived we went, his last yeah, like thirty. What? Yeah. Barry, I, I think it was Barryan Springs. We went up there and uh, trained and uh, trained. What he took us, the man took us that we trained for a while. But like, what was crazy about um, when I went to uh, when we was at the Bahamas training? Now this is the story that this was about Muhammad Ali, and he had and this here. He had nothing to do with no drug deal or nothing like that. He wasn't like that. He was just a guy. He was a real good guy, you know. So I go, we go down here, and I remember I'm. I'm uh, now I'm moving around then. So I'm hustling and I'm boxing. That's like <laughs> the split coming with me. And so um, I'm down there and uh, I'm I'm training with Tommy, his sparring partner. And uh, I go down there and he so uh, Emmanuel Stewart he give me a, a pass thing from you know around my neck so so I can move all the way around going to what you call on the back and all this stuff. So I'm down there every day we training, training, training. So now one day. Uh, that day before the fight, the Ali was going to fight. I'm down there, and um, I see this lady. I meet this lady. Now, she's looking kind of good to me. I'm young, you know what I'm saying? I'm speaking to her, smiling. She's laughing. And she say, yeah, you know Muhammad Ali? I say, nah, this is my pitch to, you know, start. I say, yeah, I know Muhammad Ali. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I say, yeah, I know Muhammad Ali. She said, yeah, for real. I say, I'm telling you. I say, yeah, I know. She said, you think you can uh, get a picture with Muhammad Ali? Get me a get me the uh, back to the get a. This is before of... social media. Yeah. Muhammad Ali was the most recognizable athlete on the planet. Oh yeah, you hear me? Yeah, and for sure. You know, you can imagine how valuable that yeah. <laughs> that connection is uh, for someone like Daryl, yeah. especially when I'm good as she was looking. So I'm yeah. like, wow, okay, this is my move. So I go, I go in the back. I say, hey Ali, and he's this kind of person he was. When I say, hey Ali, and we was like at the training camp, I used to like go early and watch him. All all day, then he'd go first, and he'd train and everything. We just sit, sit. I used to go in there and just watch him, just, just to sit, because I'm sitting with Muhammad Ali. Everybody else, too. And then then we'll come and start training when Tommy come in, because they had different sections for each three world titles. So uh, by this time, so I go in the back. I say, hey, Ali, I said, man, there's a lady out there. Uh, she want to take a picture with you. He said, what? I said, yeah. He said, is she pretty? I said, yeah, he said, girl, you don't know what pretty is. So you don't decide to talk. You don't know what pretty is. I said, yeah, man. He said, you too young to know what pretty is, girl. I'm telling you. I said, no, nah, I'm telling you, Ali, she's real pretty, man. I'm telling you. He said, okay. So he gets the guy and uh, one of his bodyguards. He said, now, nah, look here. Go out there and get her. But now, don't you bring her back if she ain't pretty, because I don't know if Daryl know what pretty is. Don't you bring her back. He said, okay, well, Ali. So he shoots out there with me and everything. I said, uh, that's her right there. And the dude said, oh, that's her? I said, yeah. He said, come on with me. So we come to the back. So we walk to the back in time. All he see, he said, hey, you, yeah, okay, girl, you right? She, she is pretty. And he grabbed her and he hug her, you know, like, how you doing, lady? What's your name? And they go to talking to her. She said, well, I want to take some pictures with you and everything. So he get the guy. Now she have a camera. So he tell the guy, he said, hold his camera. So he went to taking pictures with her like that and joking and everything. She said, girl, show her what pretty is. And then one time, this was like, guys, we always laugh. He said, okay, now kiss me on the cheek. This one picture we're going to get, would you kiss me on my cheek? She said, okay. Then as soon as he did like that, she was kiss. He turned the box. <laughs> she said, whoa, you got fast, Sam. You didn't even know that, did you? And she laughed and everything. So turn around. 
she went on out and left. And I, she, she went out and left. And then, um, so I said, yeah, she printing everything. So we thought, so yeah, she is, man, and stuff like that. So the next day, I see her. I see her at the fight. So I told him, now I'm still forgetting Muhammad Ali. I'm the one, you know, got your picture with her. I said, I said, check this out. I said, look, uh, here, you want this uh, pass here? I said, you get this pass, you just come and you sit anywhere, go anywhere you want to go. Just, you know, you can't go in the men's locker room with the pass, you know, be the lady unless you're escorted by a man. But I said, you can go and take this pass and everything. She said, yeah, for real? I said, yeah. So I give her the pass and stuff. And so when I give her the pass, that evening, the fight, now it's going to be the fight. I come out there, she's sitting up front. I'm talking about, didn't like, back then, Ali and one brought the first real expensive fight. They were like $500 or $1,000 ring size seat. That was like, Ali the one first brought that. I said, so I see her. So I go over there real quick. I said, okay. I said, check this out. Uh, I said, this is what you do. I said, now, nah, if, uh, if, uh, if somebody tell you to move, if someone, you know, people bring in, I said, if they tell you to move, you know, just move over. You got to just move over one seat or move back one seat and go down. Because she didn't got right up there. I'm like, wow, I don't want this to happen. So I tell her, she said, uh, no, Daryl, no. Because she's behind me. No, Daryl, this is my seat. This is my place. I said, no, no. I said, Look, I said no, <laughs> no problem. Exactly. Just move over. I said, they come and somebody bring somebody here. Just sit over. She said, no, Daryl, I'm telling you, this is my seat. Now I'm getting kind of mad because I'm thinking, I said, oh, I done told you, man, I lost the pass so I can get another one. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want her to find out. So I say, I said, no, nah. I said, look, man, you can't sit. Then she said, no, girl, like I'm, this is my seat. I said, no, nah, it ain't your seat. She go in the purse, she but bam, bring the ticket out. So I look at the ticket, and then back then it was like an all white ticket, real fast with gold on it. I said, oh, this is your seat. She said, yes, girl, this is my seat. I said, okay, all right, everything cool. So you knew so, she had money. Right. I know she had to be rich right. to be sitting down like this. Now, nah, the other story come in play. And then like this is like this was in eighty one. Then back in eighty one, you know, I'm coming up under the old school, you know, the dudes like on the east side. Like they back then they had something called the East Side Twelves, you know, but yeah. they was players, they was dealers, but they was real players. We were just they talking about the East Side Twelve right. in our yeah. uh, one know, of our last episodes right. when we were okay. talking about Marzette. And but they weren't doing all this, you know, like the the upbringing of the all this ride by shootings and all this stuff, you know what I'm saying? So um you know, just like a code, you know, respect the game, the game will respect you. So anyway, the lady, she said, she said, yeah, Dale, you know, one time I used to go to, uh, she said, I said, from uh, Michigan. She said, I said, from De Detroit. She said, one time I used to go to Michigan. She said, and uh, the people got me. I said, what? She said, yeah, the police had got me, and I paid big bond, and I leave. I never come back. I said, oh, yeah. I said, what's that? But she said, yeah, she was she, she acting about drugs, you know. So at that point, you know, young, you know, I come up, you didn't just go up to people like they do tonight. You, hey, man, you sell dope? Yeah, I sell dope, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I said, yeah. She said, yeah. She said, yeah, I used to move a lot of cocaine. I said, what? I said, yeah. So I'm still listening to her. And I'm fishing, too. I said, so yeah. But just, she said, yeah, Daryl. I said, well, you know what? I said, man, sometimes, you know, I do a little hustling and stuff. She said, okay, we get in touch with each other. So we talk a few days. Well, we talk the next day. We talk and everything. And uh, then she gets my, my address. And everything, and I said, okay. She gave my address. I give her my address. I give her my address and stuff. So we, uh, I leave. So I go home. So now I'm, I'm going back to training. This is what I do. I'm, I go to the gym and I'm hustling too, though. Um, so I'll do this. And then, um, uh, one day I walk in the house and my kid's mother, she looking at me all mad. I said, what's wrong with you? Oh, I guess you found you another girlfriend. She sent you some flowers and a big picture. What is this? I said, what are you talking about? You lady sent me. So then when I look, I look at the uh, I look at the uh the thing, she sent a, a picture, a big picture was saying thank you on there. It was a picture with her and Ali. Hmm. She sent a picture and it said thank you on there. She spent sent a flower. She said, and I had told her about, you know, I just my daughter was just born. I had told her about my daughter. She said, This is for your this is for your house. And you know, which class I said, cool. Then she sent the thing, uh, this was Kilters from Tiffany and Company. Now, Tiffany coming back then, it was like, you know, we come up off the east side, you really don't know, like, Tiff, you know, Tiffany and company, that's like, wow, this is really happening. That's this some is like high powered wealth. Yeah, and it's like 81. But what the funny part was about it, it was, you know, them, them little dolls, them no, doves, them little doves. It was a mother dove, a father dove, a mother dove, two, three little bitty dove, and they all had gold chains. But now this real gold, and it was what that was, Lalit Crystal, I think it was. So, I look at that, I said, man, look at that, that look pretty. But now what me and my girl, this is like funny. Me and my girl, the boxes that came in was like the satin and with the things. And that's what we, look, we took the, 
we took the uh, the uh, the uh, whatnots. Well, back then, we called it whatnot. You know, the people used to sit on the uh, console and then on the east side, and then you know, on the shelf. The shelf one of this big, but you just put that up there, you know. And so we got the box. So every time somebody come over, I said, I said, man, I said, this girl, this lady, man, send me some stuff from over the Bahamas. Check this out. We'll go get the box. Look what it come in. We'll show them like that. They'll look up there. Then we say, well, look at the box. And we look at the box. <laughs> like, like the box. silk and satin with more all More than the actual. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Much more than the blame. Yeah, I'm like, wow. Everybody, yeah, yeah. I said, but I remember Tiffany and Company. And I remember that on there. I said, man, wow, you know, whatever. So, but a, so then one day, now this was Muhammad. No, Hector Camacho was fighting uh, uh, in the, in the Alaska. Yeah, Hector Camacho was fighting. Like, he was the first. He was the first lightweight to ever fight for a million dollars. Fight that was back then. So this may be about eighty three or something like this. So um, now I'm, I'm messing with he. Uh, God bless him. So he just passed. Uh, Hector Camacho's trainer, the one he was training here, the one he was training here. I, he's from Detroit. He's from Detroit, but I forgot exactly where. You know, not like in Detroit, like the outskirts of it or something. But uh, he, uh, he, we, I was hustling with him back then. You know, just small like that. And so then I tell him about. It. So he going to Florida with. He said, "Well, you know, I'm gonna be gone for a while. You got about five weeks. You're gonna be have to sit down with you." I'm like, "Sit down, five weeks, man." He said, "Well, my people in Florida, they ain't gonna be ready now." I said, "Man, check this out. I meet this lady over in the Bahamas." I said, "She tell me some stuff, and she tell me some numbers." He said. What? I so I tell him the number so cheap by being in the Bahamas. He said, "No, you for real?" I said, "Yeah." And so he really didn't believe me. I said, "Man, look at this stuff that she sent me." I go run to get the box. I get the box. Then he didn't want to tell me what it, what I had. I run to get the box. He said, "He said, yeah, Tiffany Company. That's one of the uh, at that point Tiffany Company was one of the best. Was sterling silver? Yeah, whatever." He told he tell me about that, and I said, "Yeah." So I show him. He said, "Well, what is come in?" I said, "Right up there." But I'm still trying. He said. Oh man, he goes and look at that, and then he looked the chains that he hook up to each one was gold, and he said, "Man, look here, this is worth about thirty six hundred four thousand dollars." I said, "What?" <laughs> now we had it on this little bit thing on this tab. I was like, "What?" I said, "I get it. We take that." Me and my girl laugh about. It. So then he said, "Yeah, well, you know, um, you which call?" I said, "Yeah, she gave me her phone. I'm a caller, but I'm still on a low level of dealing. But I, you know, I'm like to got a spot, and I tell him about. It. I say, uh, "This is like I say this is uh, I say this." The number. He said, this a number? I said, yeah. He said, call her. First thing pop my man. Man, I ain't calling over to the Bahamas. You know what I'm saying? That's long distance phone call. Yeah, yeah things said, are different back then. Right. <laughs> you ain't got no, so you got a house phone. Yeah, right. $200 yeah. phone call. Yeah, right. you crazy. Right. He said, don't worry right. about it. I'm going to pay your home phone, pay your whole phone bill. Call her. So I called her. I said, hey, check it out. So I said, well, she who she is name. I called her. I said, look, uh, my, my friend won't come down there. Is everything cool? She said, yeah, I told you. When you won't come down, it's just come on, give me this. She said, what, who all come? I said, me and two of my friends. She said, "Yeah." I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Okay, then I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna let you uh I'm gonna give you a reservation. And everything." I said, I "Told her I was coming in Florida." She said, "I'm gonna give you a reservation. This is where you stay and everything." So when I gave her the reservation, I mean, when she gave me the reservation. She called me back. She said, "Okay, you got a room. You got a room for three. And uh, then this was great. Bis Biscayne Avenue, uh, at the Columbia Hotel. This is nine eighty, let's see, eighty one, about eighty two, around eighty two. Biscayne Avenue. So she say, uh, when we go over there, we get the room and everything. So now my partner, he didn't roll JC. He didn't follow us. Me and, and we, now me and Dwayne Thomas. That's we partners on hustle tip. So me and him gets in there. We drive down. He drive. He got two girls with him, and uh, we go. We all they follow us. So first I said, man, why you want to ride with us? He said, oh, you know, one will look at them Mexicans in the black going down. This what he tell me. Say so going down there, and uh, so. Uh, we ain't gonna do that, it's gonna look bad. So when we stop, we get on Biscayne Avenue, a big old hotel, they got prostitutes all around the corner. You know, everything has It's Miami. Yeah. Miami, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and then they get, that's the port, though. Right. The port come on. So, but he goes down, he stayed at the Fountain Blue. And now the Fountain Blue is really still there. Yeah, it's the, it's the fan, back then it was the fanciest yeah, hotel, hotel uh, on back Collins then. Avenue. Had, yeah. had the dolphins in it with the water shooting yeah, up. Yeah. You know, so that was From Meyer Lansky used to roll. Yeah, that's one of the best hotels they had. Right. I think they still it's got still it. still there. I was there a couple years ago. Okay, yeah. So, that and the Eden Rock were the two big ones. Okay, yeah. So we go down. They had, so, fight, they had fights there. Oh, did I mean, Maybe yeah, not yeah. in the 80s, but uh -huh. in the back in the day they did. Yeah, so he so he goes down there. He stayed there and we stayed So. Me and the, so now she tell us how to get over and how to come back. She said, okay, look here, you're going to stay. And then we stayed at, uh, what's that hotel? Uh, Jerry Lewis at a hotel casino. In, in the Bahamas. Bahamas. Back then, yeah. 
So we stayed there. She's giving you like the 411 or like the blueprint on how to get stuff from the Bahamas over to, right. so, to Miami. So she, when she, and this like to do, uh, you uh, it's called a junket. It's called a yeah, junket. Yeah, a travel junket. Right. Yeah, so we get charter a plane. Yeah, so and, yeah. they got the charter plane come, but it's, you know, for you go over to Gamma. So you bring your money. They ain't bothering yeah. with the money. Right. They just want you to get over there and Gamma because you're going to Jerry Lewis Hotel. So they ain't trying to stop nobody with no money. It's just like go get on the junket, get over there. So we get on the junket, get over there, everything, boom. And uh, I call, she called me up when I get to where I call up when I get to when I get on the show. She said, boom. She telling the cab, we get the cab, we go to her spot. So we come to a spot and everything, a house. And she tell me, she's, we get to talk, boom, 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 boom. And so she introduced me to her husband. Uh, I forgot his name, but he used to play like the good, like the acid rock. He was turning around like that because he ain't playing for me while he was there. So I got Dwayne with me. So she said, so she looked at me and he's looking at me. She said, uh, uh, I think his name was Tonky. Tonky, why don't you take uh, Dwayne and go get some conk? Go get some conk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some conk salad for Daryl. And so he said, okay, then him and Dwayne Lee. So when him and Dwayne Lee, she tell me, she said, look, girl, let me let you tell you something. My business is my business and your business. Your business is your business and my business. She said, that's my husband, but he's gone. You bring your friend, he's gone. So what we do, we do together. It's all that's okay then, boom. So I I tell her the money I got, she tell me everything. I don't forget I would get four, five things, you know what I'm saying? And that was like big then, you know? So let me ask you this. She was like a queen pen. Let me ask you Iyer. this. Iyer. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, it was crazy. Do, I mean, do you know, like, so who who was she connected to? Columbia, the Columbians? Well, she, she had, like, they had a landing script. Oh, yeah. And the land, I think her husband owned the landing script, you know, back then. L- let, me, let me ask you this. This is kind of um, illuminating my, my, <laughs> my brain cells here, uh, listening to some of the stories that Daryl's telling about He's a professional athlete. I mean, fighting on cards that you would watch on your television set. But he's obviously not making enough money. Yeah, I thought the same thing. To oh, yeah. be living the lifestyle of a major athlete. So he's hustling a lot on the side. This is before Daryl graduates to full, full-fledged full kingpin status. I don't want you to name particular specific people, but just your gut and how many boxers like you that were, you know, middle of the road, like good enough to be a pro, but not quite winning a belt. Yeah. How many of those guys you think were, were hustling on the side? Man, actually, back then in the day, a lot of, them, you know, for real. I mean, when I say a lot of them, it's just, it's like more than less. Yeah. Like that, you know, and if it, whatever, you know, if you just, if even if you just follow the fighters, like, Come up in that time, a lot of them went to bank Yeah, a lot, of them got, a lot of them got, I mean, yeah. There were a lot of uh, legal jail, legal yeah, issues. Yeah, went to jail, you know, murder cases, all kind yeah. of things. Because most of, like, at that breaking point, you you still got to do things like, you know, live. Well, you ain't got to put it like that. But you do find yourself in position. You know, the fight game puts you in position, too. Like, you know, like I say, make a bankroll or there's stuff an- like There's that. another aspect of this I want to throw out to both you and Jimmy. Jimmy and I are always looking at kind of, you know, the guy behind the guy behind the guy, like trying to scratch beneath the surface and find, you know, context and layers and nuance to things that uh, maybe aren't, you know, obvious to the naked eye. But as Manny is building the Kronk empire, he's really a, a, a groundbreaker, at least in Detroit. When it comes to breaking away from the traditional grip that organized crime had on professional boxing here, the Italians controlled professional boxing in Detroit from the 20s, I would say all the way up through the 70s. And then just like you saw in the drug world, where a lot of those groups in the 80s, starting with YBI, started to find independence uh, from having to be completely reliant on the Italians. Mm -hmm. Uh, You also see this in Manny Stewart and the fact that, you know, Daryl, I'm interested to, I want you to tell the story and then expand. You know, Daryl talks about early in his, uh, you know, early in his career, having to go do some showcases in front of some of the, OG Italians yeah. that were working the boxing world here, Sammy Fanazzo, Jimmy Quasarano, and guys like that. 
But other than those interactions, you know, younger in your earlier career, by the time the eighties are, are up and running and Tommy Hearns and all these Kronk guys are making a lot of money, the Italians weren't anywhere really to be found. I mean, Manny wasn't around those guys a lot. Was no, he? No, he, he was on certain things, but he like, it was just like small. I ain't gonna say small fight. See, they might put a show and they like, they get together and then this is what we used to say, which I don't know for sure, but they say, all right, well, this week we going, you know, this weekend we put a show down. He got a show at, you know, and it's, we used to say the mob show. But when we <laughs> said the mob show, you know, they're going to be sitting there, they're going to be smoking cigars, going to be, they're going to have group, and then it's going to be a bunch of them. And, just, and mostly all the guys in there was Italian. It's a fl- and it's a flesh market. Yeah. They're looking for people to stake. Yeah. They're looking for people to invest in. And mm-hmm. they just watched, and then it was thing like, you know, you might... You might get out, like I said, you might get out the ring. He, hey, hey, come over here. Good fight, good fight. Boom, slap your hand. And you, 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 you slap and you keep on walking. And you got $500 in your hand. And you're like, <laughs> wow, $500. How you get this? Right, good fight. Just, you know, jugging with you. And then sit down and talk to you. Everything. But everybody used to love to go because if somebody liked you, that they, they they hit you on with a bankroll. You know what I'm saying? And those were like but, the rooster tail. Yeah, like that. Or at or, Sinbad's. Or yeah, at, Sinbad's um, rooster tail. The um, Motor City Boxing uh, Club, which was on Woodward, uh, yeah, Sammy Finazzo's oh, spot. What's that place way out? Uh, another some, like, uh, uh, what's that place way out? Uh, in, uh, Rose Point. Out in, way out in Rose Point used to be a someplace right there. It, I don't know exactly. A lot of those right. guys lived there. Those Italian yeah, mafia and, guys. And mm-hmm. it's also interesting to see how, you know, from when you started, to when you ended up leaving the boxing game altogether and just doing the street stuff, but where Kronk had gone or where Kronk had evolved to. Yeah. Uh, what what do you attribute, like, the ability for that brand to explode the way it exploded? Um, and it was, again, I think a lot of people look at Kronk, at least Detroit, and they think Kronk Tommy Hearns, and then they kind of forget about, all these other major, major right, right. pro boxers that were maybe not from Detroit like Tommy Hearns, mm-hmm. but were from all around the world that were coming to Detroit to, Detroit to train with Manny. Right. What was what was what was the magic elixir? What 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 did he have that everyone wanted? It really was like the gym itself, and then it was like it was competition. You like say Muhammad Ali came down to Detroit. Muhammad Ali came to Detroit and he trained with some fight with somebody. They had a, uh, one of the Dwayne Bonds. Uh, uh, he was one of seventy two. National, I think I think that was Emmanuel. Excuse me, Not even, that was thinking that was Emmanuel's first, one of Emmanuel's first uh, national fighters. Dwayne Bond, I think he won a national Golden Glove. Then you had a Purcell Davis, was a good fighter too, heavyweight. But like I say, everybody came down to the gym. Man, that gym was like if you made it out to box, if you made. Yeah, if tell you, us about tell, tell us about the actual gym. And for people that don't know, Daryl's an East Sider, but the gym was on the West Side. Yeah, gym was on the West Side. And we come, but it's like a lot of, but most, the majority of people, a lot of, most of it was from the east side, you know, the box there. And it was like, that devil gym, you went down there, you went and got some work. Everybody, like at that time, like I say, if if, if it was 12, like it's 106 pounds to 112, 100, uh, 200 heavyweight. And you might get this right here. You might get, I mean, it's 12, say 12 brackets. And coming out of, coming out of Detroit for like, for the, where we go to like the state, then we all fight there. Everybody's boxing from which call? I mean, state. You got 11, 11, 10 coming out of the state, and then we go to the region. Boom, boom. So when we fight in the region, out the region, two of us might lose. So now you got eight going to the nationals. If you got eight going to the nationals, you got five of them winning and three of us semifinals or losing in the fight. I mean, you did you so? recognize how special he was? Like, oh, hey, yeah. this guy's giving us something that we yeah, can't no, really find anywhere else. Never, and can't it, go to New York and find it. You can't go to Chicago Philadelphia, and find it. Philadelphia. Yeah. You know, like, good fight. But at that time, if you think about it from, like, from, I know from uh, from my boxing from the 70s, say 74, 70, from 74 to 85. So all the way going to the national, I'm telling you, you would, national AU, national Golden Gloves, uh, any Junior Olympics, uh, silver gloves, anything, you have nine, eight to nine crunk fighters getting there to the national every time. And this was like, this was like 10, 10, 12 years. And even I thought it went to jail, it's still, which it was still like that. And then, then he, was, he was, fight, he was training world champions into the 2000s. Right. Um, training the biggest fighters for the biggest fights. And then going to the national. He, 
if it's not like I say I keep talking about the Nationals and the Junior Olympics, they're most all the things that like I could talk to uh, fighters right now. I talked to um, other day Michael Nunn and Michael Nunn, he, and everybody talk about him. Man, they might use his voice the way he always talk. Check this out, Daryl. This is what you got to get did. I'm telling you, I'm gonna be right here, and all you gotta do is stay on top of the man. He ready to quit. That's how he talk. So everybody we talk to, and he, they all say, "Man, we be down there." And all we look around, we see all that red and gold. We said, wow, I hope they ain't in my way, class. It's because all of us can fight. You know, at that time, it was just real good fights, a super competitive thing. And then it was like a Cron family. Jim's like, again, I, I know I, I keep on reemphasizing this point, but like, the it, was like Lam- it was like Lambeau Field or, or Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it, it was, I'd never, I was never there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've, I've, I've seen Were there video. other celebrities that would, not just from, bo- like other sp- sports? Celebrities or music, like, did it attract other like? Well, Eminem was going down there and training with Manny. Uh, yeah, for a period right. of time when he was gonna yeah. he was gonna try to do at a movie. End, yeah, at the end. What what about like in your time? Were there like any I other? Say, in the in the beginning, it was like um, it was like world champions, heavyweight world champions, and stuff. They would come through, sit and talk to Emmanuel, kick it. You know what I'm saying, like that. But not like not, not a lot of any, singers. And not like like, like baseball players or football. Any of the like the big name. Were they interested in? Boxing no, and not really. I mean, if it was, it like you know, real a book baseball player, we'd be like, "Hey, what's up? They coming this see, see us and talk with them." It's like, you know, we'd go talk to them. And they were the just, bigger celebrities than yeah. like the Tigers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. at a certain point, they were bigger celebrities than the, than the Tigers and the Lions and the Red Wings. Well, especially yeah. in the se- especially yeah. in the seventies and yeah. 80s. well, yeah. eighty four Tigers, I guess. But um, well, I was just wondering because if you think of some of like the big fights in the in the eighties and the nineties. The, there's a lot of celebrities yeah. in the yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so, Daryl, um, touch a little bit on your personal recollections of uh, Maserati, Rick Carter, and and Demetrius. Like, mm. did you know Maserati from yeah. like when you were in high school? Yeah, well, Maserati, he was, uh, you know, he's from the East Side, and then he, uh, when I was, when I was, uh, he, I view, I saw them fights. He was in my corner. So he worked you know, your he, corner he, in a yeah, couple he fights. Yeah, well, Emmanuel worked it. He was just a water guy. Put the boom, boom. Emmanuel, like he just like he worked at some of the fights. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't no trainer or nothing like that. He's just like... There's that famous that. photo that I think I showed you that when Maserati was, I'm guessing, a teenager or maybe in his early 20s, mm-hmm. but there's a free press photo of Tommy Hearns. I think it was before he won the belt. Mm-hmm. I think it was 79 or 80. And it's Tommy Hearns, Mayor Coleman Young, <laughs> Manny Stewart, and in the background, Maserati Rick Carter. Yeah, you. If you look at a lot of the fights, if you've seen, he would always be there. Sometimes having mink coat on and all like yeah. that. He always well, he fancied himself a, yeah. a Super amateur fly. Bo- well, an amateur boxer. If you go to Maserati Rick Carter's grave right now, there are boxing gloves on the grave. Yeah, he loved boxing. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's what he just come. To. He really wasn't no boxer. You know. But he. he but like, I've seen photos of him, and I'm guessing these photos were taken either at the Kronk or at Kronk affiliated events. I've seen photos of Maserati Rick yeah. with. Sugar Ray Leonard and Don King. Yeah, he and, used to come to all the fights yeah. and everything. He was like, you know, he used to be there all the time. Like, all the, a lot Did of you, time. Was there a point, though, where you saw, like, Maserati Rick? Because everything I've heard about Maserati Rick Carter was that he was someone that people knew because he had a colorful personality but wasn't really that big of a deal until he was a really big deal. Like, did you see a point when, like, you were like, oh, that's just Rick. And yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Rick's on the news now and Rick's yeah. rolling, uh, mm-hmm. you know, pretty deep and making a lot of money. Right, yeah. When he came over, like, like you know, say when he came over with us, you know, I would know he would be, you know, I'd just say, that's Rick, that's Rick. Come to the fights, you know, that's Rick, you know what I'm saying, like that. And then later, you know, I seen him change, you know what I'm saying, as far as me know the game, you know, about how the hustle was. So I seen it. I don't know if a lot of people did. But I Demetrius... Said, was more behind the scenes and more smoother. Yeah, you know and Maserati. What do you mean by that? When I mean like more behind the game and more smooth, it's just like he was bigger than what people thought he was. Uh, people didn't think he was that big. Yeah, but he really was the guy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Everyone then, thought Rick. Everyone, real, Rick, the one pulled. Rick, the one start messing with him. You know what I'm saying? Started messing with Demetrius. So he run across something. They say I don't know what. It I'm saying Rick. The Maserati Rick had the bigger glamour uh, persona. Yeah. 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 But Demetrius was the, the, was the, the bigger man. shot caller, and yeah. everyone that I've spoken to, you know, have said to me point blank, Maserati Rick would have been nothing without Demetrius. It wasn't like he could really stand on his 
own so, two feet. In so that remind regard. me, like what they were they were working together at one point, and then they had a falling part, out. No, they never had a falling out. Not public. I mean, no, they, they might were, have privately, but publicly, yeah, they, they never they, had a falling out. They were best friends and business partners. So, so who killed Maserati Rick? Best friends? No. Uh, Maserati Rick was most likely killed by um, Big Ed uh, Hansard and his crew. But they they blamed the best friends, didn't they? Best They're... friends were at war with Demetrius and Maserati around the same time. Yeah, okay, right. So, so sometimes some it gets conflated. Right, right. Uh, but most likely the hitman on the Maserati Rick Carter murder was Ricky Parker, who was Ed Hansard's main uh, enforcer. and um, but But Ricky Parker was tried and acquitted. But there's a lot of people that believe that. Uh, so, so did you have a sense of, like, how... So you start off just like it's a it's a side hustle to supplement your the income you're getting from boxing. D- did you ever have a sense of like how precarious this could be? Like the higher you get in the game, like guys get whacked, guys yeah. get killed. Did yeah. it ever? Did you ever think like, geez, like at some point this is getting maybe yeah. more dangerous than I'm than comfortable? <laughs> yeah, well, I never did because, like I say, the high side of these sides, you know, you things like that happen. But like high hustle. See, I hustled. I made my position too to hustle, like fall back, like you never, you never see me like with yeah. a mean coat on with all the jewelry and stuff like that. But, you know, I just, I, I was hustling on. I used to call myself the ghost of my friends, and I'm saying with the <laughs> laughing joke, cause like I might have been getting like it back lows in. If I was getting lows in, say 150, 200. But then the numbers are, if say, just say all three of us we partners, right? And if I get admitted at this number, you know, cause I like I say. Met people out of town, different place. If it cost them, I wouldn't make number like a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred off you, and like that, right? But the number when I give you make a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred. Actually, if we all went to you, you was the man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Everybody thought, you know, everybody yeah. think you was the man because I gave you the number that was so sweet. You know, everybody can get some money. You ain't got to just, you know. Like I used to tell people, men's make money, money don't make men. You know what I'm saying? A lot yeah. of drug dealers they get okay, they get this money, then they think they turn. Or put a blue, put a blue, blue vest on because they got money, but that ain't gonna work. <laughs> and you all these yeah. really flashy, violent, in-your-face personalities were again they were either being killed mm-hmm. yeah. or they were going to prison. Yeah, uh, and and they all just uh, created a power vacuum for someone like Daryl to come in and just kind of quietly yeah pick up the pieces, uh, the pieces of of what had been shattered. Because think think about it. Uh, Johnny Curry goes down in 87. White Boy Rick goes down in 88. Best Friends indictment comes down in, I think, 90 or 91. Chambers are gone in 88. Chaldeans are, uh, the Iraqi mob is gone by 90, uh, 91. So, you know, early 90s, all of these groups have, have killed each other off. And, you know, I, I don't think uh, there were people on the street complaining that someone like Daryl w- would want to come in and and do things the opposite, the way they'd been being done for the previous decade plus. Um, I mean, I think in Detroit we've seen the ebbs and flows of of, of violence on the street when it comes to the drug game, and uh, there wasn't a ton of violence until the late sixties, early seventies, and then things quieted down in the early to mid seventies, and then ramped right back up in the late seventies until ninety. And then in the 90s, things mellowed again. And Daryl was really at the forefront of that mellowing. Unfortunately, as we said, uh, for him, you know, the public might not have known who Daryl was, but the government knew who he was because of this desire to cut into to Kronk. And then I want to, to to color up a little bit more the name I threw out earlier in the in the podcast. And, and this is we'll, we'll start to wrap up a little. Andrew Chambers not related to Daryl is a professional, a quote unquote professional informant, yeah. meaning he w- is employed by the government, not as law enforcement, but as a street figure to bring them cases yeah. in like an official capacity, which I guess could be okay. If you were, if you were making the cases clean, right. But uh, specifically Andrew Chambers was discontinued as a professional informant for the DEA, uh, in the early 2000s after it was found out that he had perjured himself in close to 20 
different prosecutions. I think it was like 18 prosecutions. Right. He had perjured himself in. All those cases got tossed out. Um, they discontinued him. Now, the scary part mm. is in the last decade, they've reactivated him. Right. But, you know, excuse me, because that's my major thing about that. And this, see, the attorney general, Janet, Janet Reno, was the attorney general at that time. She, now, the attorney general, if you want to know about, is over all the uh, FBI, DA, yeah, DA the and, Department and of Justice. The yeah. Department of Justice. And they over all the judges and everything, too. You know what I'm saying? So now they dis, they had deactivated him and they had put out there that he didn't supposed to work in the field or he didn't supposed to work go to court. And in both things, he went to the field on my case and he went to the court on my case. And he, and at that time, he was deactivated because they hadn't found out he was at live on a bunch of cases and everything. And then the DEA used to do stuff like this for me. He'd go to jail. One time he would give him to jail for like a prostitution when you uh, you know, pick up a prostitute. And boom. He'd go to jail. He'd go to jail. He'd turn right around. He'd get the first phone call. Bam, he called DEA. Two minutes later, DEA called. He had this one DEA used to come call. Get him, and he boom, going on like get out of jail. You know? They send yeah. this guy around the country. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, to it's, different cities, into oh, different crews. It's, it's, yeah. uh, and it's entrapment. I, mean, I was it's, just going to say entrapment. It's the definition of entrapment. And again, yeah. Daryl's not saying that he wasn't dealing drugs. Right. I We're saying mean, that the boss that brought yeah, Daryl down and almost took his entire life yeah. away was and, dirty. Right. And then you're talking about, you know, this is what gets me, I tell people, you're talking about the United States Justice Department. This is who knocks you off. And I just want to know, then, you know, I talk about Illuminati. And I was, you got a president, you got a picture of the United States president. You got a picture of the United States president. Why? You got a picture of governors. You got a picture of senators. And like that. Who is the United States Justice Department? What picture you seen of them? Who runs now, the, who runs yeah, the who, DOJ? Who, right. Who you runs don't the see DOJ? no picture of them? Nowhere. Them is the mob. Them the gangsters. <laughs> no, the government is the biggest gangster yeah. in the room uh, on, on a number don't of occasions. That. Yeah. Robbers, because they're not going to, they're not going to arrest. If, the, the DEA or the FBI, they, they put a case on you, right? And they study you, and they find out how much you make, what's the things you're doing, and then that's when they come in. It got to be a reason. They ain't just going to arrest you. They can know you're selling drugs. If you ain't making no money, they ain't going to waste their time because it ain't, it ain't worth it. And who's left holding the bag? So they indict, they bring a, a dirty informant into the case to make a case against Daryl and, and other boxers. Three boxers take the case. One flips. One's acquitted. And Daryl's the one who's going to do life in prison. Man, and and, all... and it's uh, it, again, it's just it, it's a uh, it's kind of a mockery. Did you, uh, do you remember? System. I mean, the Andrew guy. That did you have any like sense early on that this guy's not who he said he was? Yeah, and then I'm 27, 26 years. I laid there and I thought about. I used to laugh to myself. And you know, I'm like a discreet person. I like I read people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying how how they doing or what they like. Say we sitting here, you talking. Now my thing that I picked up with you, you a hand guy. <laughs> you, always, you always move your head. No, I, I, I was and good. Then, then the lady over here, she her eyes, she boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? It's and you, good. you know, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now Scott's right there. He more, he, he this and then he this. And then you don't see his hands that much. You know what I mean? Because that's like you read a room yeah, yeah, unconsciously. Good. You know what I'm saying? So that's good. When I went to, when we went to the Bahamas, when I had got there and uh, we went early. You know, I went early because I had this girl, I'm going to take her down here and uh, boom, and uh, I take her down and stuff, and uh, we do what you And I see, I get to the thing early. He said, "Oh man, what?" So that's he. Uh, he's there. Up. You're yeah. you're there a couple days early, and right. all of a sudden he's there. Right, and then and you're like, "Well, but, this doesn't make sense." Right, he see me. Oh, what's going on? And then Stan said, "That's my man, Daryl." He said, "What? What are you doing here? What do you mean what I'm doing? Here? You don't come?" I said, "Oh, I came a couple days early, man, so I can sit back and enjoy the place where we make our deal." He said, "Oh yeah." So he told me every reason, asked me every reason why I should. Well, I got your room, man. Uh, I got your room. I said, no, nah, I'm cool. I got a room. I said, I've been coming here since the 80s, early 80s. He said, what? I said, yeah. I said, I got a room already. He said, oh, well, I got you a suite. I said, where else I'm going to stay? I said, you know, because I, yeah, I said, he had it wired up. He had it wired yeah. up. He wanted the you whole there. room was wired up. I told <laughs> of him, course, I said, yeah. Give it to, I said, well, stand in with you. I said, you're your partner. Don't mess over them. Go on, let them take the room. And then they went on, they took the room, and it was, was wired up. Yeah, I bet. Later on, yeah, later on down, I wouldn't do this case. They said stuff that they had did in the room and stuff like yeah. that. But it was, so there were some things that didn't add up yeah, yeah, and I would, about and he, him. Yeah, and he, then he said another thing. He said, well, uh, uh, let's, uh, he said, don't, I said, we can do it here and take care of it, and then I can go and finish hanging out with my people. He said, no, nah, uh, we want to uh, make it where it ain't, ain't much traffic. Ain't much traffic. If you finna make a deal, but didn't he also traffic in the world. Didn't he also make you 
do the deal like on a patio so that they could take photos. Like, no, see, so it wasn't, you wanted to do it inside and he's like, no, let's go no, out. It's nice they, weather out. Right. And that was so saying, he definitely <laughs> said it, but he, he did it out in the car. Definitely say he didn't want that much traffic. And then they went into it. But what happened was, that's what I'm picking up. I said, no, I'm cool. Let's stand in, uh, in Donald go. I said, man, they're my partner. So whatever they say good is good. I don't need to go. And see, Stan and went to the thing, and they opened up the thing up, and they took some stuff out of it. You know what I'm saying? And then that's when it come to the point, I was, and that's another thing about me studying the law, like I said, entrapment. See, the last entrapment case it was was uh, De- DeLorean. Remember oh, yeah. He beat the Well, you know what? Up. Actually, the last major that's entrapment Detroit, case yeah. from here was actually just a week or two ago mm-hmm. with the, the conspiracy to, but see the word, to kidnap yeah. the governor. Right, but you see they the got, word. These guys got off because the fe- there was a 20-man conspiracy, and it comes out that the federal government had, on four, had 14 of those 20 guys on the payroll. Right. So they mm-hmm. could have stopped it from before it even started. Right. And then see the words you use now. You say the conspiracy. They changed. The entrapment is no longer an entrapment with uh, the— uh, you can't go into it and use the entrapment case with the federal government because it's called conspiracy. But back then with DeLorean, DeLorean beat the case on the entrapment. They gave enticed him with everything. Okay, they know they studied him, like I say, Roberts. They know he uh that he was John DeLorean, the former yeah, John, whiz the kid in the auto company. The, yeah. They started, know his company was back going to the future. Yeah. And they going to start, started that, his own uh right. car company. Stainless and, steel. Right. Nobody wants stainless steel's car because you got stainless steel's car, no is no body work. Now, you know, you know and his saying? company was flailing, and in yep. order to save his company, he tried to broker a cocaine deal yep. that was, that so was actually the government. created by, by the, the government. Because they know he was going under. Right. And, you built uh, a time machine yeah, out, out of, of a DeLorean? DeLorean? Yeah. And, then, and then the irony of the whole no, the irony of the whole thing is yeah. after the whole thing falls on its face. Then Back to the Future, the movie puts it in the movie, and the mo- the car then becomes cool. Yeah, right. And right. It becomes a collector. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah. It, I mean, just uh, in other cases, I'm familiar with what happens a lot of the times with these professional informants is, you know, they're like, okay, hey, let's let's deal some drugs, and then the person's like, no, I'm cool, man, and and then they keep on, no, oh, come on, man. Come yeah, on. yeah, that's yeah, right. They, no, I got yeah. this good. Like it they keep look, on, keep yeah, on pushing that, you, pushing that you. That makes it entrapment. And, yeah. and then right, and then it's like, well, when it goes down. It doesn't excuse the person from from agreeing to do it, but it's like, is that how ethical? There's there seems to be some major ethical yeah. problems with that approach the, 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 to law enforcement. You know the the storyline that's behind that, which is that they don't even want Daryl. Right, Daryl was like something they wanted to throw back in the ocean. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, right. right, But but they were so mad at Daryl for not giving them the bigger fish. They're like, okay, well, you're gonna uh, stick it to us now. We're gonna stick it to you. Yeah, and yeah. and the the process at that time, the prosecutor they were saying. Uh, uh, Mark, I, I can't think it's Mark something, but they used to call him the Terminator by the Flint. And they said if he would have won that case, if he would have got that and got Emmanuel and Tommy which called he would move it up into Washington doing a uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. They, 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 was, they, they wanted up, to advance their so career. You know who they ended that up, case. The feds ended up getting uh, maybe 10 years after this was Tractor Trailer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, right. So it was the yeah. same type of they targeted – uh, trailer because he was helping his cousin, uh, Q Dog, uh, Quazan Lewis, who was the biggest, uh, mar- oh, yeah. marijuana dealer big, in the city time. in yeah. the late 90s or 2000s. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Tractor Trailer, I believe, had to go to jail for a short period of time, um, because he was helping his cousin, uh, launder money through real estate. So yeah. it, it's not, uh, unheard of for, for right. the government to, to look for leverage points with uh, uh, targets based on those targets' affiliations to c- celebrities. Yeah, but— uh, Or the celebrities' affiliations to yeah. other people. But just back on my soapbox, the war on drugs, but there's, you know, issues like, like I said, white-collar crimes, uh, domestic assault, sexual assault. There's a lot of major crime problems in this country— that get a fraction of the attention yeah. from the Department of Justice. Right. That yeah. drug, that well, drug look, trafficking. Look, Jimmy, does. look, uh, I think we discussed this on an episode in the last uh, handful of months. There was a, a year ago, there was a big, big, heralded, huge mafia bust in New York. Oh, they yeah. They took yeah. down the, administ- the, the hierarchy of the Colombo crime family, yeah. who's the top three defendants in the case are 89, 85, and 78. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, Jerry these Hatcher. guys have one foot in, one of them just died a year, he did. Uh, last week. Yeah, he did, before. literally. So, I mean, yeah. these guys Mush. literally have one foot in the grave, and you're, you're 
judging the the the, the value of, of them being a target at a level that is just to me just way overshoots reality. Not to say that those guys should get a free no, pass. No, no, yeah, it's stuff that you thing, just right. brought up yeah. that are domestic issues that need yeah. to be addressed no, right. from law enforcement are getting swept under the rug, and we're going after these, I, I, you know, these this big game, big, big, big head hunting where it's more symbolic it's than actual political. It is, political than, it is political, than yeah, actually because as you point something. out, they'll score points in D.C. and they'll climb the ladder, yeah, yeah. get get a higher appointment. Maybe a, a judicial appointment. Some, you know, yeah, I mean, like something. I said, they say if he would won that case, he was this. He they moved him up to Washington. So he tell, so tell us about just how you were able to stay positive, convince yourself there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I remember going on your, uh, the 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 part of the internet where you can go and look up federal criminals, and I I would I would, Daryl. I mean, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I mean, I would check. I mean, not weekly, but at least once a month, every couple of months, I would check Daryl in the system to see if he got an outdate. Mm-hmm. And for years and years and years, it would just be like life, no outdate. Yeah. And then finally, I remember clicking on it and I was like, wow, they gave him, they finally gave him an outdate. Like no matter what happens, he'll be getting out at this particular time. And uh, I, if it made me, Kind of, if it, made, if it made my heart swell, I can't imagine yeah. when you found out that you actually had a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it was. It's like, and and then I don't know. I guess it come up just how you you come up in life, though. I sat there and uh, <clears throat> I sat there and like at the time, you know, you, you're a fighter. That's what you don't never quit. You know what I'm saying? And I remember the thing down the cross. Jimmy Man had a a thing on the uh, on the door with the you know with the with the uh, the small bird or some the, the uh, the geese or something trying to eat the small bird, and the, and the small bird was choking the geese as the geese trying to put him down. <laughs> quit is never, quit is never quit, and when you know, winners never quit, and quit is never win. I'm yeah, winners never quit, and quit is never win like that. So it was always the point. I'm always thinking I'm, I'm gonna get out of jail, and then I was telling him uh, the other day, and I said like, you know, I got into the Bible. You know how people say, oh, now you're in jail, you are gonna get in the Bible, you know, holy roly, and then I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> But I got in the Bible just like reading it, you know, reading the Bible about faith and stuff like that. And my mother, she she always was talking about the Bible. And then I was telling them I had the other day, I had when I got out, it was all kind of crazy stuff. I was learning with the phone. So I see a preacher, uh, preachers come, ministry people. So I pushed the thing one time. I typed something in. I forgot. Yeah, I want to talk to a preacher. You know what I'm saying? And so it was the, the uh, Mormons. You know what I'm saying? And this was something else was fascinating. It was the Mormons. And I was like, Oh, what is a Mormon, man? So I, they call, hey, you want to come over your house? And I said, come on my house. You know, I said, well, I stay with my sister and everything. I'm out of jail. I said, well, we'll come over and talk to you and everything. So one day they come over and stuff. Then they went to give me the thing about it, about how they uh, ride the bike around, you know, the neighborhood and talk there. But then they went to name all the places and neighbors. So I, so I told myself, I'm going to come to church. They said, okay. So I started going to church. I started going to the Mormon church with them. And I went, and then one day I did, you know, you come up there and you want to talk about something happening in your life. And I said, well, you know, I'm saying this, I told him about me and everything. I said, and then what's the funny part is about this? I said, before I went to jail, I never seen no Mormons. So when I was a kid, I never seen no Mormons. Right. I said, y'all ride around. I said, y'all got the armor of God on y'all because y'all trying to change people's life. I was telling them how times is. And I say, I say, I remember if you came over my house over there in 1985, 84, something like that, and brung them bikes and went talking about going to my mom and pray. I said, hey, y'all, come on. They just brought us 10 free bikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be getting sold in the yeah, junkyard in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They'd have to walk bikes home. and stuff like that. <laughs> but, it, but, like, for real, I just, like, I kept my faith up, you know, period. And then, like I said, I worked out and stuff like, you know, you're doing the street. But I just never. And then I didn't think, I never thought I was going to do life in jail because it was so much. It was so much that I'm, you know, I'm not with the reading up. I never should have been in jail that long. I'm not saying I shouldn't have went to jail. I and for on people that don't know the federal justice system, they don't parole you in the feds. No, like if you got so a life that, sentence without parole, so it's you like die. you know your your you your don't. entire life is at the fingertips of people that don't know you, don't yeah. know really about your case, 
And, you know, it's it's either they're going to let you out after 25, 26 years like they did Daryl. Yeah. yeah. Or gonna they're, they're going to keep you in there the, you know, the rest of your life. And it's so crazy. Like, in the earlier days, in like, in like before, like, the 2000, later on, 2015, 15, you go in there, like, every, I don't know, every year or every two years, you go to your uh, flop consular. Here. No, nah, you don't go. You don't. Oh, right. They don't flop. Right. They don't. I'm thinking of state. They flop. Yeah, but you know, you go to your consulate and you go to your consulate. And you you read everything. You fill the papers out. And this when I first when I got on on them real hard. You know, like I said, I'm laid back, but you know, I I can't be what I need to be at the time. So I read the thing and I say, uh, uh, they say on the thing they say, uh, outdate, outdate, deceased. I look. So I got again. I read and they say. Uh, uh, projective, yeah, projective, outdate, deceased. So I say, deceased, projected. I said, I'm not signing that. I said, that's a devil. Uh, I'm not gonna sign my life over. So the dude say something slick. I take the paper, I tear it up. So now, come on, know what you want to do? Mom? I'm tearing it up. I'm not gonna sign. Come then he called me and they take him, put me in a hole. You know, put me in a hole for like a week or something. But it was no way in the world I was gonna find. Then later, it's, it, they took that off. Uh, projective, outdate, deceased. They just say. Out project out they unknown. Unknown, right. Yeah, but that's like that's horrible. You know what I'm saying? You saying that? I couldn't know where in the world I could say anything like that. So how did you find out? How did you find out? Did you find out like was it during the pandemic or right before the pandemic? Right before the pandemic. You the, you realized that you only had a year or two left. Yep, I had out date because what was the the funny part was about it, it was uh I'm laying down and uh my I called my sister in law one time. She said, Hey, uh, this uh, my my niece's baby's daddy. Had sent this, had talked to this. his mother was doing something with the governor, and she do cases for kids unlawful for juvenile getting life in prison. So she, she, she told. He said, "Well, you know, uh, you know, my uh, my uncle used to call me on my, his uncle. My uncle in jail, and he never had no case and nothing. Like he was first offending all that. Uh, we, just, I want to try and see if you can do something to get on there." She said, "Well, look here, take this dude's number." So she took this guy's number. He called in Washington, so he called Washington. Washington dude called a guy, Mr. Wise. Uh, a lawyer, Mr. White, a public defender now, and then he sent me a thing saying uh, that he think he can get me out of jail and uh, what you call it. Now, back then, at this time, I'm going to the law library all the time. I really know, like, my case, I can, I can know my case. And I, I'm, 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 I read that, nah, I slide up under my bed because all this, this they, they, uh, you know, they're solicited to people with life in jail. So, you know, they, you know, somebody, you know, you're going to reach it anything. I drown in water, we ask for a couple a reach and get a cup of water, you know yeah. what I'm saying, to get out. So I said, I'm not going to witchcraft. So then, like, about three weeks later, I called my sister along and she said, hey, did you talk to the, the man? Because he said he, he can get you out of jail. I said, what are you talking about? Then when I went back in, I found the paper, and then I called me. He said, look, uh, uh, I I just need to get your number and everything. This is your number. Because she said, I sent it in. I don't know what's happening, but uh, you shouldn't be in jail. You, uh, you It's a new law. Yeah, two, 2018, uh, First Step Act, yeah. federal legislation, to help people just like Daryl yeah. that were on excessive prison terms yeah. for nonviolent offenses. Yeah, and it gave and nonviolent. And and let me tell you, there are people that are uh, that are as deserving as Daryl getting out on this, but there are also some people that aren't necessarily like Daryl. There are people that are that were incarcerated on nonviolent offenses, but most likely had violence in their past mm. so those guys i saw some of those guys getting out before daryl yeah so it's I mean, just another demo but daryl eventually walked out uh in 2021 yeah and uh sick. he's living his best life right now and uh, thank you so much for for joining us uh you're always welcome on the og podcast because like i said you are more than just an og you're a double og <laughs> well, yeah thanks. and is there anything uh people can find out more about your story Do you have uh like a website or anything that you want to plug or? Well, I mean, we well, go to you can go to Gangster Report, yeah. which is my website where yeah. I've done some uh, writing on Daryl, and then I'm hoping that uh, you know with with the OG podcast and and how we're going to be growing this brand that uh, we can you know help Daryl share his story even more and uh, maybe even get into uh, some some old school boxing content. 
where it doesn't even have to be about his case, where we can just <laughs> be doing some yeah. deep, deep dives into yeah. the history of Detroit boxing or the history of pro boxing. And use Daryl's uh, has a, a great Rolodex and network of all these boxers that were his era. And I'd love to, to give him some type of platform. So look for that possibly in the future. And, and I'm going to be helping Daryl with um, uh, platforming him. Um, I think there's a good chance that uh, he'll be appearing um, on a couple uh, uh, well-known platforms in the future. So, Well, thanks again for coming on. And uh, I want to remind everyone, please follow us on social media at Gangster Podcast, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, go to TikTok. YouTube and, and watch Daryl fight on ESPN. There's a couple yeah. of yeah. Daryl Chambers YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also our YouTube channel, hopefully, I know I say this every week, but it's, it's slowly, it's, but, it's surely. slowly but surely, but I think we should have some video content up really soon. So thanks everyone for listening. Please spread the word. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks Mark behind the glass. Thank we you. will see you next week. We're out. Out. All right.